Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Welcome to today's seminar, Global Food 5050, inaugural report on gender, diversity, and power in the global food system, co-organized by IFPRI and Global Health 5050. I'm Katarla Taylor, events manager at IFPRI, and I will moderate today's session. Thank you for joining this virtual event live, and thank you to those of you who are watching this recording. To participate in our Q&A session that will follow the presenter's remarks, please submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. In the lead up to the 2021 UN Food Systems Summit, tens of thousands of people participated in a global civic experience to produce a shared framework of collective action. Gender equality and women's empowerment were amplified as a lever of change and embraced as an area of our work with the potential to contribute wide ranging positive change in the transformation of food systems in the coming decade. The Global Food 5050 initiative is a response to broad stakeholder demands for a global food system that is accountable for progress towards gender equality. Today's event marks the launch of the inaugural Global Food 5050 report which reviews the gender and equity related policies and practices of 52 global food system organizations as they relate to two interlinked dimensions of inequality, inequality of opportunity and careers inside organizations and inequality in who benefits from the global food system. Today's seminar will present the findings of the report and explore how this new accountability mechanism can power a broader movement to demand more equitable, and inclusive organizations across the global food system. Let me now call on Johan Swinnen, Director General at IFPRI, to provide opening remarks. Yo, over to you. Thanks very much, Katarla. And uh, thanks for the organizers for putting this event together, a very important event, I think, at the launch of this report. Um, I'm very much delighted to welcome everybody to, uh, to the event. And to start, let me congratulate our colleagues at the Global Health 5050 and at IFPRI who contributed this important report. And IFPRI has certainly been very proud to, con uh, to collaborate on, on this uh, joint effort. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers, so I'm going to try to keep my uh, introductory remark uh, short here. We know that globally, women are key actors in the food change, the food value change, the food systems. They are farmers, they're entrepreneurs, they're processors they're traders, they're retailers, and they are consumers. How often their work is, as we know, often undervalued, underpaid or unpaid often and overlooked. Women's influences and voices in food systems are limited due to a number of factors, such as gender norms, structural biases, and the unequal division of rights, resources, and responsibilities in food systems make often that women and girls are more vulnerable to a number of factors, such as malnutrition and poor health. We know from research at IFPRI, but also from uh, research at other institutions, that these inequities have been reinforced by COVID-19. And COVID-19 has disproportionately affected women and children and the poor in society in general. This is due to a combination of factors, as we know by now. As we rebuild today, uh, build and rebuild our food systems after the pandemic, gender equality must be at the center of our strategies and actions. Gender equality is a critical factor for innovative, for healthy, and for inclusive food systems. We know from research, again, at IFPRI and elsewhere, that improving women's agencies can lead to increased agricultural productivity, increased adoptions of technologies, modern technologies, also all kinds of uh, practices which contribute to climate mitigation and climate uh, <clears throat> uh, and dealing with climate adverse effects. Women are often the stewards of good nutrition within their household, promoting healthy lifestyles for their children. We should therefore clearly empower women by raising their voices and leadership in all decision-making processes along the food systems. The report that we discussed today, the Global Food 5050 report, addresses evidence gaps in this particular area. It analyzes more than 50 global food system organizations, and it focuses on a number of crit critical dimensions, such as redistribution of power, policies to attack, to, uh, to tackle uh, gender imbalances, and addressing the dynamics of inequality. 
The report has many lessons, but it shows that there's much work left to be done. While many organizations claim to support gender equality, this is not always reflected in their actions. Women are strongly underrepresented in leadership's roles, depriving the food systems of talent, expertise, and diverse perspectives. I think organizations, and that's also a conclusion of the report, must be more transparent about their gender equality policy so the world can see what they are doing to meet the stated goal. The report comes up with a series of, uh, of recommendations, of conclusions to support meaningful, act, meaningful actions, such as identifying key areas for improvement and holding organizations responsible. So in conclusion, this inaugural report makes marks the first step in IFPRI's partnership with Global Health 5050. We're very excited to continue this joint effort and to see where the future will bring us in this area. I think together we can break down barriers and bring greater recognition to the, to the billions of women playing a critical role in our food systems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jo, for those opening remarks. Up next to provide opening remarks is Kent Buse, co-founder and co-director at Global Health 5050 and director of the Healthier Societies Research Program at the George Institute for Global Health. Kent, over to you. Thanks, Katarla. Um, it's lovely to, to be with you today. I want to start by acknowledging Lawrence Haddad of GAIN um, for being the catalyst of Global Food 5050. And of course, a big thanks to IFPRI for the partnership. And um, Johan, I liked your three R's that you led with, but I just thought you might consider a fourth representation along with uh, rights and resources and so on. Um, like Johan, I think that the that, the, that Global Food 5050 is significant for a couple of reasons. Let me just give two. Writing in the foreword to the first Global Health 5050 report, the UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed talked about the need for replicating this kind of analysis across all of the, the SDGs. And this is the first of such efforts. Second, um, it's actually great to be applying this method to food systems, as we learned at the Food Systems Summit, as Katali mentioned already, um, food systems are integral, obviously, to the health of, of both people and of planet, um, in the same way that gender equality is foundational to um, thriving societies more generally. So GH5050, or Global Health 5050, is a feminist collective. We have a tiny staff, but we have a, um, over a dozen paid volunteers and a powerful group of advisors based around the world. And when Amina Mohammed made that call for independent accountability across global development organizations, it was clear, as Johan said, there's a need, but what she couldn't have known is how effective our model, this model could become. GH5050 has received testimonials um, from many, many, many organizations in our sample of, of 200 organizations. Um, but not just from the CEOs. I want to stress the fact that a lot of young women staffers use our report to hold their leadership to account, to argue that more can be done um, as evidenced by the front leading, the front running organizations. Having said that, over the years, a few organizations have been in touch and said, oh, there's nothing to see here, move on. Um, and we haven't moved on. We've looked, we've assessed, and we've reported accordingly. Um, We'll hear just how much further the sector has to go. Johan alluded to that in his opening remarks. Um, when um, Jemayam and Sonia uh, dig into the findings momentarily, I think there's gonna be a lot of discussion about gender. So I'm gonna just make a couple of remarks about evidence, um, you know, which is something Johan brought up. First of all, we collect evidence. And, and I, I bring these up because I hope they'll inform the way that Global Food 5050 moves forward. So first we collect evidence, but we don't collect evidence for the sake of collecting evidence. We collect it for the sake of action to surface problems, but also surface solutions. And there's a lot of good things happening in the sector as well. Secondly, our starting point is that evidence does not speak for itself. It needs to be amplified. And hence the importance of us moving outside of the think tanks and academia. And that's why global Health 5050, we've established an advisory council with the likes of Helen Clark to amplify um, and bring that evidence into their respective spheres of influence. 
Third, we take the view that we need evidence that's in fact digestible. And when you see the, the presentation later, you'll see that for all of our data points, we come up with, with infographics that are quite simple, but we try to feed them to activists and advocates so that they can use them in the work that they do. Fourth, we think that there's a need for evidence that is robust, independent, and it's in the public domain. Um, Johan talked about both transparency and accountability, and we can talk a little bit more about our methods um, in the Q&A. Fifth and finally, I wanna make the point that for GH5050, evidence is very much a public good, it's a public good, but just because it's a public good doesn't mean it's free, far from it. It takes a lot of um, human resources to collect the data, to verify the data, and to put it in the public domain. Um, for the most part, the data that you're going to be see, seeing today has been collected by, as I mentioned, the paid volunteers of Global Health 5050. Um, and, in for, and in fact, most of our volunteers are women. And for some reason, it, it appears that, um, that men think to, seem to think that gender equality is, is, is sort of women's work. And it's good that Johan is here, and I'm glad a few others are here, because that is patently not the case. Um, so while our service is a public good, we need to see more investment in these kind of independent accountability initiatives as far as we're concerned. So thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak. Thanks for the partnership, IPRI, and thank you all for joining us today. Katarla, back to you. Thank you very much, Kent, for your remarks. I now have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Agnes Kalabato, who is the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy to the 2021 Food Systems Summit. Dr. Kalabata is also president of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, where she leads the organization's efforts with public and private partners to ensure a food secure and prosperous Africa. We are delighted that she has joined us today and look forward to her remarks. Dr. Kalabata, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you for having me, um, Taylor, and thank you, um, Senen, John Senen and uh, the, uh, everybody else who has contributed to the development of this report. Let me thank IFPRI, um, the Global Health 5050, and Lawrence Haddad, as was uh, called by the previous speaker, for this report, which is extremely timely given its focus on gender, diversity, and food systems, and their importance in achieving the development goals. Food system transformation is something that we've been working on for the last two years and it's something that I'm happy to talk about. But when it comes to gender and how it impacts equity, it becomes even so much more important. We all know that gender equality and food systems are entangled. We have clear evidence that increasing gender equality results in improved food and nutritional security, as well as other social and economic benefits. The reverse is also true. Where gender inequities prevail based on laws, policies, and gendered norms, people are also the hungriest, the poorest, and the most nourished. Securing sustainable global food systems is only possible if women everywhere are empowered and their rights recognized and respected. This is because women, especially rural women, are instrumental in the excuse me, in the fight against hunger and malnutrition and in making food systems more productive and sustainable. They grow food, reduce loss, make diets more diverse and agricultural, produ and agricultural produce more marketable along uh, our value chains in, in all food systems. Women are very critical in this journey. They hold a key to shift, shifting to better consumption habits and in more countries, they are involved in food purchasing and preparing among other things important, which are critical important roles in food systems. Yet, despite their diverse and crucial role in the food system, women's contribution often goes unrecognized, undervalued, overlooked, and constrained by limitations in their access to resources, such as land, reasonable wage, financing, digital technology, and markets, even when these are now vastly available. Women consist, constitute nearly 50% of labor in agriculture in low income countries, but they present less than 15% of all landowners. This must change. 
At the same time, compared to male farmers, female farmers typically manage small plots of land and have less access to agricultural information, financial services, and other key resources. It is unacceptable that more than 60% of women in sub-Saharan Africa work in agriculture for half the pay that men get or not pay at all. We need to raise and address these unacceptable injustices and be intentional about it. Transformative and equitable food systems that are gender just are those which guarantee a world without hunger, where women, men, girls and boys have equal access to nutrition, healthy and nutritious, healthy and safe food and access to means of production. They, they are systems where roles, responsibilities and opportunities and choices are equally available to women and men, not just men as we see most of the time. The Global Food 5050 report that we are launching today brings out the fact that inequities may take two dimensions inequality of opportunities in career pathways inside organizations, and inequality in, to, in, in, in who benefits from global food systems. Therefore, while we focus on promoting gender equality and empowering our women, it is important that we also assess whether the just and equitable food system, whether the just and equitable food system that we promote actually empower the livelihoods of women. Shaping food systems so they become gender transformative requires a combination of knowledge, sound policies, good regulations, investments across productive and consumption continuum. The women in those areas are already doing their part. They are counting on our support as leaders of organizations, agencies, and governments to make the, action the actions visible in transformative ways. I'm proud to say that the transformative action, that this transformative action is already happening. For instance, the UN Food Systems Summit recognized women's empowerment as a river of change. And during the summit itself last month, women advocated for three areas that are extremely critical. The anchoring of gender equality and women empowerment in national food, uh, national food pathways increasing access to resources and services such as security of land tenure, affordable financing, relevant digital technologies, and quality extension services, and the development of account accountability mechanisms on a gender and equitable transformation. However, we still have a long way to go for us to achieve gender equality, as indicated by the Global Food 5050 report, we are still far from practically achieving gender equality. And I call upon all institutions here today to do their part, because it's in doing our part, each and every one of us, that we'll be able to come through from this gender inequality. Thank you for inviting me, and I wish you a great meeting. Over to you, moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalabata, for your remarks and the reminder that our food systems need to be just. Up next, we will go to our panel, uh, to our keynote, our speakers who will walk through the report for us. But before we come to that, a brief reminder that the Q&A session will follow our speakers' remarks. So please do go ahead and submit your questions on IFRI's website, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and by using the hashtag AskIFRI on Twitter. We'll now turn to the results of the 2021 Glo Global Food 5050 report which will be presented by Jemima Njuki, Director for Africa at IFRI, and she led the process of IFRI's engagement in this report. Jemima will be accompanied by Sonia Tanaka, Coordinator at Global Health 5050, who also manages the Global Health 5050 Collective. Ladies, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Katala. Uh, it's great to have you all. Thank you, Dr. Kalibata, for that opening um, keynote. And it's good to see you here because less than two weeks ago, we had the UN Food Systems um, Summit. And one thing that was really clear is the need to address the inequalities in food systems governance, including gender inequalities. And also the fact that food systems transformation will not happen unless we deal with these inequalities. 
Um, I like to say that we are in the worst of times, but also we are in the best of, of times. Um, the worst of times because these inequalities have really been exacerbated by COVID-19, but also the best of times because we have an opportunity to make food systems more equitable and just. And I see this report as a critical first step in, in doing so. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't appreciate the partnership with Global Health 5050 in working with IFPRI to produce um, this report and the results that we are about to present. And working with you has been an absolute pleasure the last couple of months. As IFPRI, we have learned a lot from, from your work and we do hope that you have um, you have as well. So this report, just like the Global Health 5050, is important because food systems organizations, they make decisions on investments. They make decisions on what technologies will be developed or deployed. They make decisions on funding priorities. So their outcomes affect millions. If their policies are inequitable, their outcomes will be too. If they have no commitment to equity, their outcomes will not be equitable either. And if their leadership is not inclusive, it is also unlikely that their outcomes of their work will be inclusive. Next slide, please. So the purpose of, of this Global Food 5050 report is, uh, is twofold. If you could go to the next slide. Um, it is to catalyze first a progress on gender equality by enabling enhanced accountability uh, driven by rigorous evidence, as, as Kent Hughes uh, mentioned earlier. But it's also to recognize uh, the role that gender and, and equality plays in food systems and in food systems transformation. And in this re inaugural report, we have used data from 52 organizations that are also part of the Global Health 50-50 um, um, report. Um, the uh, accountability index focuses on four key domains that are really very closely interlinked. One is the commitment to redistribute power. Um, the second is the gender and geography of global food systems um, leadership. And the third is policies to tackle power and privilege imbalances in the workspace, in the workplace, and addressing the gendered power dynamics of inequalities and outcomes. We are going to present some of the results uh, from some of these indicators in these interrelated uh, domains of, of gender and equity in food systems organizations. Next slide, please. And the first one we look at is the commitment to redistribute, uh, to redistribute power within organizations. And one of the key indicators here is public commitment to gender equality. And we do recognize that uh, part of accountability is actually organizations being um, able to present um, their commitment to gender equality in a public, in a public way. And you will see as we proceed with these results that in some of these domains and, and, and indicators, organizations do pretty well, while in some others, there is a lot of room uh, for improvement and progress is needed. So when we think about commitment to gender uh, equality, we have about 65% of organizations that have public commitments to achieve gender equality for the benefit of all. But then we should still be worried because we have about 4% of the organizations in this, um, in this sample that make no reference to gender or women and girls. And this is a great concern because if we are talking about the engagement, the roles that women play in, in food systems, organizations need to be actually very explicit about the commitments that they make to gender equality. Um, and to the empowerment of women and girls. Next slide, please. The second set of indicators is on policies to tackle power and privilege and uh, imbalances in the workplace. And I would like to invite Sonia Tanaka, who will take us through this domain and the other two domains that we cover in this report. Over to you, Sonia. 
Thank you so much, Jemima. Um, so I, I just want to reiterate, as Jemima had uh, just um, just said, that certainly central to this notion of accountability is transparency. And um, what we measure uh, across a set of variables, but, um, but in particularly um, relevant to this set of, of workplace policies, is the, the transparency of organizations' commitment to workplace gender equality in the form of, of policies. Um, and one of those policies we look at is uh, workplace gender equality policies. Um, and we are in particular looking at looking for policies that have really specific measures, not just levels of commitment, but actually measures that um, that organizations are taking to advance those commitments. Um, and so we find that about two thirds of the organizations um, in the sample uh, have accessible policies um, with specific measures. Another 17% um, have some level of commitment, but no measures to back up those uh, commitments. Um, and, and then for 16%, there's uh, no reference to uh, gender equality in the workplace. We find, um, we, we're also looking at whether organizations have transparent diversity and inclusion policies for the workplace. And for this variable, we find that there are even fewer available. Um, if we go beyond gender to look at broader issues of, of diversity and inclusion, it's just half of organizations that have um, transparent policies available. We're also looking at, um, at board diversity and inclusion policies. And if we consider that, that boards are amongst you know, the most influential bodies in the, the global food system, um, one would hope and expect that there are, uh, there are transparent and rigorous policies that are ensuring uh, representation inside of these bodies. Um, we find, however, that there are even fewer available. So just 20% of, of organizations have policies that are available in the public domain with uh, specific commitments and, and mechanisms um, to advance diversity and inclusion, whether that's uh, targets um, or quotas for representation of, of particular groups um, or some level of, of measurement. We we also look at um, policies that are, are, are not just to, to, in, to enable the career advancement and representation um, in an equitable and, and diverse way, but we're also looking at whether organizations have transparent policies to ensure a safe and enabling uh, environment. One of those policies is anti-sexual harassment policies. Um, and this is in addition to, in, in the report and in the index, you can find more on uh, parental leave policies, uh, support to new parents, and flexible working policies, which are also um, essential to the, uh, the working lives of, of parents, and particularly women. Um, for, for, for now, I'm, I'm just going to focus on the findings around the anti-sexual harassment policies. For, we found policies for just half of the organizations under review. Um, and for this set of policies, we look at not just the availability, but we're also looking at, um, at the content of those policies. And we have a, um, developed a, a, a framework of best practice elements of a comprehensive sexual harassment policy. And those that's based on, um, on literature and global norms and across the um, across the the four uh, well, four best practice elements, we see that that policies are are performing relatively well. Um, the the one area uh, that that seems to be the weakest in terms of performance is this aspect of mandatory training. Um, and so we find that while uh, you know that the content of these policies is 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 um, there seems to be positive performance for, for three out of the four. Um, if, if staff aren't, um, aren't adequately trained and aware of the contents of the policy, then um, that will certainly affect its, its uh, effectiveness. So we, the third set of variables um, looks at gender and geography of global food leadership. 
So while the second set of variables looks at the, the policy environment of an organization and um, internally, this set of variables looks at the, how those policies are being translated into, um, into outcomes. And that includes outcomes such as who has access to leadership positions and, um, and the gender pay gap. Um, and so we gathered data on the demographics of the leaders, the CEOs and the board chairs. Um, and that data is what we can find um, in the public domain, as well as what data can be considered and, you know, to some extent globally relevant and comparable. So what we find is that 73% uh, of CEOs and board chairs across these 52 organizations are men. Um, and an even greater percentage of leaders are nationals of high income countries. Yet a larger proportion, 91% of leaders were educated in high income countries. Um, and, and just 6% of leaders are, are women from low and middle income countries across these organizations. Um, another important measure of uh, equality in the workplace for which there is some level of, of publicly available data, albeit very limited amount of data, is the gender pay gap. Um, and so for the very few organizations where we could find data, we see that eight of the 10, um, if we look at the left side of the graph, eight of the 10 have a gender pay gap in favor of men. And, um, and that's even among organizations that have, uh, if we look at the right side of the graph, a near equal distribution of men and women in the, the highest quartiles uh, of salary. And so this, you know, this, this, these findings are, are certainly disappointing. Um, what we also find to be very disappointing, though, is actually the, the lack of data that is available generally on the gender pay gap. And so among the 52 organizations, we find that only 12 are publicly reporting on their gender pay gap. And only one of those 12 are uh, reporting voluntarily. And so the other 11 are reporting because they are, are required by law. So there's a real lack of transparency um, um, for this data across the sample. Um, the fourth dimension that we look at um, is, the, is whether organizations are addressing the gendered power dynamics of inequalities in their, in their programs and their policies and in their activities um, ex that are external in how they're trying to reach the people that they're, they're reaching, trying to reach. And we, um, you know, we, we certainly consider these, these four sets of variables. We've, we've presented them separately here and in the report, but they are, are very much interrelated. Um, our, our theory of change certainly um, assumes that the, the people who have access to decision-making, access to voice and power um, have a direct relationship to the policies, the priorities, um, and the programs that are, are delivered by these organizations. So when we're looking at the, the gender responsiveness of organizational approaches, um, we apply the WHO gender responsiveness scale. Um, and that ranges from gender blind, uh, where we find that 4% of, of organizations uh, seem to show no reference to um, the differences in opportunities and resource allocation for women and men. 6% um, are gender sensitive, where there is some acknowledgement of gender norms, but that doesn't seem to be translated into um, any adjustments in the programs that are being delivered. 31% um, of organizations are considering how gender norms affect access to resources. And we do see some, um, some tailored programs that are targeting women or men to address their specific needs. Um, and then the, the largest proportion of organizations, which is encouraging um, 60%, we find evidence, um, at least that their, their strategies, what they're telling the world, indicates that they have gender transformative programs in place. And that's programs that, um, that not only recognize that gender norms affect access to resources and power, but are actively trying to, to change those gender norms and, and foster progressive changes in, in power relationships between women and men. 
And, um, and then finally, we look at whether organizations sex disaggregate their, their programmatic data. And, um, you know, and we consider this kind of one of the a fundamental input to a gender responsive program is collecting, analyzing, and reporting data by sex. And yet we find that just half of organizations are actually doing so, um, and a full 19%, um, we find no sex disaggregated data and, um, and no reference to or commitment to, to produce or report such data. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot more in the report and you can also find um, the, the results by organization in the Global Food 5050 Index, where, uh, which can be found on the globalfood5050.org website. I encourage you all to go and, and check it out. Um, and thank you. Back to you, Katarla. Thank you very much, Jemima and Sonia, for that overview of this very timely report. We will now turn to a panel discussion with several experts who will discuss the findings of the report and the way forward. We will begin with Jamila Biggio, Senior Coordinator for Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment at USAID. Jamila, thank you to USAID for providing part of the financial support to produce this inaugural report. You've read the report. What results make you optimistic and what concerns you most? And also, what can organizations do better? And how can funders such as USAID support that? Wonderful. Thank you so much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join you all. Um, and our thanks to Jemima and Lawrence for their vision in creating a global food 5050, drawing on lessons from the global health 5050. This is exactly the kind of adaptation we need when we identify initiatives that work. It's a welcome step to adapt, expand, and apply them to other sectors. So we really welcome these steps in the global food space, especially when it comes to data and accountability, because we know that what gets measured gets done. So by shining a spotlight on what global food system organizations are doing to advance gender equity, it helps them know where they stand and can inspire them to take concrete actions to close those gaps. It's also a way for us to both hold our partners and ourselves accountable as we work to advance just and equitable food systems. So we're very, we very much welcome that USAID is included in the Global Food 5050 report um, and that we collectively together as organizations, governments, institutions committed to uh, advancing more just and equitable food systems that we together can learn and exchange lessons and improve our practices. This is a goal that the Biden-Harris administration welcomes and works towards every day through our flagship Feed the, Feed the Future initiative, um, which is dedicated to ending global hunger, poverty, and malnutrition. We were thrilled at last month's Food System Summit to announce $10 billion to promote food systems transformation, which will include efforts to help women realize their full potential and create food secure communities. This includes steps from increasing financing for women-owned small and medium enterprises, closing nutrition gaps, to fellowships for African women policymakers to advance their leadership as decision makers. I highlight these ex as examples of what we all must do more of to support the system level change by and for women and all their diversity that we need across the food system. Our policies and programs should also do more to recognize that gender inequalities are both a cause and an outcome of unsustainable, unjust food systems. And this is where we see the Global Food 5050 report as a key step in the right direction toward greater accountability. And we were thrilled to fund this initial report as part of our commitments to the Food System Summit. You asked about what were some of the findings that we, were, uh, we took note of. So first, some of the areas of, of progress that we thought were encouraging. First, um, as you shared, the fact that 92% of the food systems organizations covered in the report have made public commitments to gender equality. This is important, the rhetoric is growing, 
that 67% have publicly available policies or target specific plans for promoting gender equity in the workplace. It's important that we not only have these policies and these plans that are measurable, that for which we can help be held accountable, but that they're also publicly available, that uh, we can be, that we have taken these kinds of transparency steps. So we very much applaud the, the, the two thirds of, of organizations reviewed that have, that have done that. We also welcome the 60% of organizations that have indicated that they position the work they do in relation to transforming gender norms and gendered systems and structures as key to their efforts to advance better outcomes around, around food security. And that's something that we hope to very much see 100% of the organizations do to truly recognize um, all the data and the research that we've seen about the fact that gender inequalities and inequities in across the food system hold back um, our progress uh, around food security globally. Uh, so when 100% when of the organizations recognize this and are investing in programs and policies accordingly, that will help us see the progress that, that we want to. It is also important to identify um, and recognize some of the gaps which, which you've noted. So there are the leadership gaps um, with fewer than 30% of organization CEOs and board chairs, women, only 6% women from low and middle income countries, we know we need to fix this. We need to have diverse and inclusive leadership of food system organizations. There are also the data gaps that, that you noted. The sex disaggregated data is essential to identifying gender disparities, yet only 54% of relevant organizations provide this kind of information. This is a real gap. This is an important gap that we need to fill. It's something USAID has been focused on. We actually require across our entire agency that all individual level data is sex disaggregated in our own reporting systems so that we can ensure our work as an agency is reaching, benefiting, and empowering women and girls. It's something we're focused on in the food security space. So in fact, 2022 next year will mark the 10th anniversary of the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index which is a partnership between Feed the Future, IFPRI, and others to standardize how women's empowerment is measured and ensure that we are collectively focused on the gender quality outcomes we wanna see. Let's actually look at how we are empowering women in the food security space in agriculture. Um, and we, we very much are excited to continue to expand this work and ask our partners to join us in, in, this, in this approach of investing more um, in the data and in sex disaggregated data. These are a few of the examples um, that, that we highlighted from the Global Food 5050 report, um, which we very much welcome. We need this kind of transparency. We need this kind of opportunity for exchange of best lessons. I've shared some of the areas where USAID is focused on sex and age sex disaggregated data. We very much look forward to learning from where others have best practices in this space and looking where we can adapt and integrate that into our programming. So we very much hope that the Global Food 5050 will become a permanent initiative that tracks this important data over time, helps hold us all accountable, inspire us all uh, to, to change um, and to approve the, the work that, that we do, because that's the only way we're gonna see um, progress and help realize the commitments that we've made for just and equitable food systems. So whether you're a potential funder or an organization in the report, USAID uh, very much um, encourages, uh, encourages us all to embrace uh, the global food 5050 report as an important step to increasing transparency and accountability across our whole, across all of our food systems. Um, so thank you. Congratulations for this report. And we look forward to continuing to work with you and all of the organizations featured um, to exchange and learn and grow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamila, for those remarks and reiterating USAID's commitment. Our next panelist is Rick White, who is the chair of the private sector mechanism of the United Nations Committee on World Food Security. Rick, 
we have just come out of the UNFSS with a lot of optimism and bold actions for food systems transformation. And the role of the private sector was a major part of the discussion. This report includes a sample of private sector organizations. So in your opinion, what role can the private sector play in leading the way on gender equality and women's leadership? And what are some of the good practices that you are seeing? Well, thank you, uh, Katarla, and I'd just like to say thank you to the organizers uh, uh, for the honor of being here and, uh, and speaking on this extremely important topic from the private sector perspective. There really are a lot of things that we can do um, to help address gender equity in the private sector, and, and maybe I'll just touch on, on a few of them. Um, and, and, and the first one is, is setting inclusion goals and actually reaching them. Many businesses are making clear commitments to gender equity, and that has to be at all levels, of course, not only the, the, the total workforce that includes management levels, all levels of management, and the board of directors as well. So we need, we need to reach those goals, and I know progress is being made, but it seems to be quite slow, and we have to be more uh, deliberate in that going forward. Um, another area of uh, that, that the private sector is looking at as well and should be looking at is maternity and paternity leave, recognizing that child rearing is a family responsibility and ensuring women have maternity leave uh, to, to help support uh, them, but also that families can share that responsibility in any way that they want. And so that's that's another important area that needs to be looked at and continue to be worked at. Um, proactively assessing service offerings, particularly in finance. Uh, we hosted a PSM event last May to further action on gender heading into the FSS and the CFS negotiations. One of the key areas we discussed there was, was finance, and, and there were some really meaningful discussions about how finance actors need to think about retooling programs and the people who make loan decisions to increase access for women. That applies to many more sectors from agri-retail to processors considering how to source from women produced products to cooperatives and also how food retailers are sourcing from women-led businesses. And another area is, is we, we need to focus uh, as well um, on, on SMEs. Um, and that, uh, that, that is a, a vital role um, that small and medium-sized enterprises and farmers can and do play. Uh, they are by far the biggest part of the food system, and many more of those businesses are women-led than we see at large-scale businesses. So we have to get really serious about entrepreneurship training and market access, as well as wage-based employment um, issues. Um, to, you mentioned what are some of the good practices that uh, that we are seeing in the private sector. Um, just a, just a few examples. Um, you know, Bear uh, Bear is 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 striving for gender parity in all management levels, and they are committed. Um, they're making advances on overall inclusion and, and diversity approach to their business. And by 2025, that company aspires to establish a 50-50 gender balance as an average across all combined management levels, including lower and middle management within that organization. Another example uh, we see is the African Development Bank um, has affirmed commitments to closing the gap in financing for women at uh, United Nations uh, Food Systems pre-summit. And uh, that commitment indicated that by the end of 2021, this year, the bank is expected to have provided close to $500 million, of which $150 million will, be, will benefit women in the agriculture sector and to work with public and private sector partners to develop alternative financial models to increase the ability of women farmers to access the financing and skills they need to grow sustainably. Nestle, another example, um, they have a gender balanced acceleration plan in play there, and, and their target is to increasing the number of women in the top 200 senior executive positions by 2022. And finally, um, a little moving away maybe from, from specific business initiatives, there's the, uh, the 2021 Bloomberg Gender Equity Index that measures gender equity across five pillars, female leadership and talent pipeline, equal pay and gender pay parity, inclusive culture and sexual harassment policies um, and, and pro-women brand. 
The GEI brings transparency to gender-related practices and policies at publicly listed companies, increasing the breadth of environmental, social, governance uh, data available to investors. And, and speakers previously talked about how important the data is um, and how important the data is to, to generate transparency. And at a time uh, when it is critical for firms, for firms, I should say, to demonstrate their commitment to uh, gender equality, the companies included in this year's index are setting an example for more transparent reporting and disclosure of social data. So we're starting to see some of the right things happen. The data is, is there and we can see, and, and Sonia pointed out some of those areas and, Jem, and, and Jemima as well, um, from, the, from the report. It, extremely important to know where we need to shine a bright light on where the problems still are and will exist in the future. And so that we can make attempts to provide um, some of that transparency required to uh, help move the world into that space where gender parity is uh, is becoming more and more um, prevalent, I guess, especially in the agriculture space. So with, with that transparency, that will be the incentive that moves this along faster and farther. And, it, and, and there's many areas where this needs to move along. Um, I am a a male here, and uh, and we need a lot more males standing up and talking about this going forward as well. We are all in this together. We are all people, and whether we're male or female, we should all be behind this 110% uh, because we will get to a better spot uh, for businesses and for outcomes and for management and all those uh, and all those things and sustainability as Dr. Calabata had talked about earlier as well. So thank you uh, for the opportunity. Katara, back to you. Great, thank you Rick for those remarks and the clarion call to your fellow men that their participation is critical. We will be coming to the Q&A session in just a few minutes. So please continue to submit your questions on ifbri.org, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and by using the hashtag AskIfBree on Twitter. Vicki Wild, Senior Program Officer of the Gender and Agriculture Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is our next panelist. Vicki, the foundation is committed to gender equality and has been a key supporter of gender research within and outside of the CGIAR. How do you see Global Food 5050 contributing to or enhancing the work that you do with food systems organizations? Well, thank you for the welcome and thank you to everyone involved in producing this Global Food 5050 report. As others have said, it is so important to shine a bright light on what our organizations are doing to address inequalities and the power differentials in our work. Clearly, we all need to pull up our socks and to do more. In the agriculture team of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we recognize that the poverty and the undernutrition of the farmers who grow the world's food is a failure. It's a gross failure. It's a failure of our market systems. It's a failure of our financial systems, our information networks. It's a failure of policies. Because when those systems do work well, men and women have a solid ground from which to come out of poverty. But today, the women and men who produce our food are the very people who are being hit hardest by hunger and now also by climate change. Ultimately, climate change is a big equity issue too. Those who did the least to contribute to the problem are going to suffer the most from it. And those, those who are being hit hardest and first are the farmers around the equator. And this poverty and undernutrition is also sexist. So even today, no matter where in the world you are born, you will be poorer if you are a girl. Even as health education metrics of women and girls might be improving, their economic lives continue to lag. And this is because women continue to be restricted by longstanding social norms to the lower skilled work or the lower value commodities. In our priority countries, we're finding gender gaps in income as high as 53%. So today in the face of mounting challenges attributed to climate change, we including droughts, floods, locusts, 
We have to grapple with the fact that climate change will be a risk multiplier. Uh, it will exacerbate these pre-existing inequalities. So what this means in, in the light of this um, report is every time we make resources available that do not challenge the status quo, we perpetuate this inequality. So it can't be overstated in, in its urgency. As you pointed out, one of our priorities is uh, the CGIR. Um, if PRE, uh, along with 14 other research centers around the world, devoted to the R&D on poverty and hunger. And the CGIR is uh, composed of scientists from 100 different countries. It's truly a global community. And the reforms today are to support a research and development community focused on climate resilient food systems that deliver diverse, healthy, safe, sufficient, and affordable diets and ensure improved livelihoods and greater social equality within the planet's boundaries. Now we've long invested in the CGIR innovations, especially crop breeding uh, for drought resistance, pest resistance, flood resistance, and historically, we've invested uh, in the CGIR's nutrition work, including the women's empowerment pathways to improve nutrition. And together with our partners like USAID, we've invested um, in the PROWEA metrics, women's empowerment and agriculture metrics, so that we can track what's working or not working for the empowerment of women in the sector. But what's new and different, an example of how we can use our resources to promote more equity is our investment also in the CGIR's gender research platform, the first ever global uh, platform that will leverage the scientists around the world to put gender at equality at the tip of the spear, at the forefront of everything we do in global agriculture R&D. It will upgrade the methodologies, measure the impacts of agriculture technologies and innovations, and help close the global evidence gaps on gender issues for climate adaptation. So this is one example of how it's the world's largest foundation. We can use our investments to promote greater equality. And I will say internally, we have four priorities. That's productivity, income, nutrition, and women's empowerment. And women's empowerment truly is the vehicle for the other priorities. So this is how we can work out there. But I've always believed that you can't achieve on the outside what you don't practice on the inside. So what are we doing internally at the Gates Foundation? And I'm happy to say that we have, you know, our, our top priority as an organization is to accelerate the ability of every person to live a healthy and productive life. In two words, we call it impact first. But to help us get there, we have a brand new and updated diversity, equality, and inclusion strategy, and a number of new work streams to support that strategy, including our workplace culture, our talent, diversification of our talent, and the all-important leadership accountability. But the work I might be most excited about is the one we're calling Equitable Partnerships and Voice. And so while we've realized that our, our focus on impact lays within local context, everything lands in a particular place, our partner mix and the voice of our foundation has remained largely dominated by the United States and Northern-based institutions. And this does limit our ability to achieve impact on the ground. We want to do a better job of actively listening to our partners in the communities they work within and to invest more in elevating their voices and ideas. So I think this is exciting. It gets to one of the key points of the Global Food 5050 report, how to redistribute power, how to tackle power and privilege imbalances, including the gender inequalities. And we will be doing more to elevate um, local rural women's organizations, women farmer organizations voices in the work we do going forward. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Vicky, for the sobering reminder that females are disadvantaged wherever we are born and consequently the urgency of action being taken cannot be understated. Our final panel panelist is Lawrence Haddad, who is the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. Lawrence, your organization has been part of Global Health 5050. How has this helped to improve your approach to gender equality and women's leadership at GAIN? And what are some recommendations you can give for ensuring Global Food 5050 is impactful to organizations? Um, hi, Katarla, nice to be here. Thank you, Jemima and Kent and others for inviting me. Um, so I, I see the I see the global 5050 uh, global food 5050 as a as four things. I see it as a uh, floodlight. It's it's showing it's putting a floodlight on the issue of gender equity and gender transformation, and that's really important because uh, it's too easy to forget about that particular issue. Um, the second thing I see the report as doing is it's acting as a beacon. It's telling us where we need to be as a as a community. It's showing us what 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 the ideal situation looks like. The third thing it's doing is it's it's a mirror. It's it's holding up a mirror to us and saying, how well are we doing? Are we where are we doing well? Which parts of the community are doing not so well? Which which dimensions of gender transformation uh, are we are we all doing badly on? Are we all doing well on? And I think the fourth thing is it's a spotlight. It's a spotlight that helps us identify uh, best practices, uh, how we can do better as, a, as, a, as a, uh, at an individual organizational level, but also as a sector level. So I wanted to share with you a slide that I shared with our staff. As so again, is a 250 people. So Katala, if I may share that, if that's okay with you, um, if I can find yes, it. Yes, please, sure. I'm gonna try to find it. Ay, ay, ay. I can't find it. Uh, our team can pull it up for you, one moment. Let me, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so this is, um, this is a slide that I shared with, with my staff back in um, May of this year. And it shows you gains, um, the change in gains score between 2018, when I think I think Global Health, that was the first year it was issued. It's certainly the first year that GAIN was featured in it. And then, you know, it shows you uh, as we go up to 2021, uh, different dimensions are being added as we as we progress. And I, I showed this to my staff because, first of all, you know, GAIN is doing fairly well. It's one of the uh, one of the high scorers, if you look at the top left hand corner, but it's not one of the very high scorers. So we want to, we, we feel like we're good. But we want to get to great, so that's that's really important for us. But more importantly, it shows us where we're doing okay and where we're not doing okay. So if you look at the uh, in 2018, in the third column from the left, in the workplace gender equality policies, we were you know need significant improvement, and then by 2019 we'd moved into the green space. Similarly for workplace diversity and inclusion, which is the fourth column from the left. We were in the amber space in 2020 and we moved into the green. Now I'm looking as a, as a CEO of the organization, I'm looking obviously at where we're getting worse as well as where we're getting better. Uh, bo uh, if you look at 2021, board diversity policies have gone from green to amber. That's the fifth column from the left. Um, the other place where we're not, where we're, we're getting worse again is on uh, our governing bodies on gender parity. So I'm, I'm, so I'm having a, so, so these two metrics are, are uh, starting a conversation with my board secretary, who's on the senior management team, and my board chair to say we're not doing as well as we could be doing. How can we do better? Um, the column on the far right hand side talks about sex disaggregated monitoring and evaluation data, and we've gone from green to amber and we haven't improved in 2021 so i'm now working with my director of uh, research and monitoring to say what what's the problem here how can we get from amber to green and the the one area that's gray is the gender pay gap area 
we just did a gender pay gap uh, for the first time this year. We, we finished it in June, so we'll be reporting that uh, next year. So I just wanted to show this to you because it's very important for me as a CEO to be able to show this to my staff and to say to them, we're doing well in some areas, we're not doing so well in other areas, we're getting better in some areas, we're, we're, we're actually getting worse in a couple of areas. And it's a really important tool for us to be able to have honest and open discussions about uh, gender transformation and gender equity. And you can stop sharing now, uh, Katawa. Thank you so much for that. So the second part of your question was, um, you know, what recommendations do I have for Global 5050, Global Food 5050, to make it more impactful? I think the first thing is you celebrate success. Um, don't don't demonize poor performance. I think that's from my from my three years at the uh, Global Nutrition Report. I see that that's kind of counterproductive to demonize. I think um, work with the organization and support them to get better. And actually, global health has been really, really good on that front. And I'm, I'm sure global food will continue. The other thing I think about, uh, and this is my final comment, Katala, is the health systems and food systems are not the same. So are there, are there some particular features of organizations that work in food systems where, where the report can extend into? And I know that GAIN works a lot with suppliers and partners and contractors. And a big part of our the debates we have within GAIN are, you know, we have certain values, we have certain um, DEI standards we want to maintain, diversity, equity, inclusion standards. How, to what extent can we expect that or demand that from our partners in, the, in supply chains um, and even partners uh, really kind of far down the supply chains and in our workforce nutrition programs we have successfully said to employers it's great if you introduce a workforce nutrition program for your staff but can you introduce this to uh can you help can you support your contractors to also develop workforce nutrition programs so i think i'm not i'm not an expert in health systems but i think the supply chains and the food system involve the kinds of players that Rick was talking about, the SMEs, more than in the health system. So how can the report not only help these 200 organizations, but how can it help the organizations that they work with and contract with? So back to you, Katala. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for those remarks. And thank you to all of our speakers and panelists thus far for your comments. We now have an opportunity to engage with our live audience and our presenters will respond to as many of your questions as time permits. In some instances, we will consolidate your questions because of time. We will get started with a question for you, Sonia. This question is coming from John Ulumwengu at IFBRI. How different are the results by food system components in terms of inputs, production, processing, distribution, consumption? Can you just give us a bit on the Results? Uh, sure. If I well, I, I mean, if I understand that question, it's um, asking for a bit of a, a sectoral or a, um, a functional breakdown of organizational performance. Mm -hmm. um, and we we haven't been able to to go that deep into the data. Um, and uh, as we I think at the beginning of the um, the session indicated that the the set of fifty two organizations is part of a larger sample of, um, of Global Health 5050 organizations. And, um, and so in the future, we're certainly hoping, hoping that we can expand and diversify the types of organizations that are included in the, in the review. Um, but for the for time being, we haven't gone into that level of depth. Great, thank you. And Jamila, coming to you next, how do the, how do the priorities discussed today in the context of food systems align with the larger gender priorities for USAID and the US government? Thank you so much. Yes, um, we are thrilled in the US government that um, we are advancing commitments to gender equity and equality uh, across our government. Um, so the examples that I've shared today are part of a broader effort and commitment across the administration that realizes that um, until we unlock the full potential of women and girls to fully participate 
in society, then we will not be able to realize any of the development outcomes, foreign policy, national security outcomes we um, have identified. And so we're, we're thrilled actually in, in the US government, we've um, launched a new White House Gender Policy Council um, that will bring into the White House uh, policy process a focus on gender equity and equality, both domestically and globally. So we are connecting that conversation and recognizing that the challenges and opportunities um, for women and girls in the United States um, are connected with those that we see for women and girls globally and that um, we need to have an exchange and, um, and, and shared lessons and priorities across the work that we are doing to advance gender equity and equality, both at home and abroad. Um, as part of this effort, the US is, um, will very soon launch the first ever national strategy for gender equity and equality. All departments and agencies are going to be tasked with developing implementation plans, so stay tuned, um, both for the overall U.S. government strategy and for USAID's implementation plan. Um, and all of this is a part of um, the steps that we are taking as an administration. Um, you know, through that strategy, we're going to have uh, a dashboard, annual reports, data shared to help hold our be, be more transparent and hold ourselves accountable, very much in line with, with the vision um, and the focus of, of the Global Food 5050. Um, and that's you know just one example of the ways in which we are right now trying to um, ensure that the recognition that we have to tackle uh, we have to tackle discriminatory policies and systems um, across all of the work that we do to achieve the outcomes we want to see, that we have to center that in, in our policies and our programs in our investments. Um, so that's something that right now the U.S. government is making concrete through our strategies, through our um, our new plans where USA is revising our gender policy. All of these are ways of ensuring that we are um, explicit about our commitment to advance gender equity and equality, that we are taking and identifying specific um, targeted measures, and that we are um, holding ourselves accountable and are, are transparent um, in the progress that we're taking. Um, and we see this, as I said, across the entire um, uh, spectrum of, of the work that we do from foreign policy and national security to development. And so um, very much kind of part of our approach to food security, but also part of our approach to um, global health, to improving education outcomes, to uh, tackling, to improving climate resilience and tackling um, climate change, uh, to uh, addressing um, uh, conflict and, and insecurity and crises um, and to promoting economic growth. So we really kind of across all of our investments now are, are centering this commitment to gender equity and equality. Great, thank you very much, Jamila. Jemima, coming to you, we have a question from Charlotte Heberbrand and she's asking, having an ongoing Global Food 5050 effort will be a great outcome of the UNFSS. How might gender issues be taken forward in other ways post the summit? Um, thanks for that question. So um, there are discussions, so two ways um, actually. Um, one is through the national uh, food systems transformation pathways, because a lot of those pathways actually do include commitments to gender equality. And there are uh, plans uh, to actually organize uh, stakeholder groups under the UN system in each country, working closely with governments uh, to develop work plans to implement those national food systems transformation pathways. And the second way is we are in the process 
on discussions on uh, coalition on making food systems work for women and girls. We've had meetings this week and last week with the room based agencies for them to take on um, this coalition. So we will see that moving uh, forward in the next couple of weeks. And we hope through that that we can continue some of the actions uh, that were proposed during the summit and the lead up to the summit, but also support other coalitions in terms of ensuring that they are addressing gender equality and, and the empowerment of women and girls as part of their work. Some of those coalitions are pretty pertinent uh, to women and girls. If you think about girls in nutrition in the school meals um, coalition or the coalition on, uh, on zero hunger. So we are hoping to also uh, um, have that coalition work very closely with the other coalitions to mainstream uh, gender and the empowerment of women and girls. Thank you, Jemima. And I know that you have questions for your panel yes. as well, so I'll let you go on with that. I, I do have some additional questions based on what um, um, I've heard from the panel, but based on also other questions that have been coming up as we have promoted this event. And the first one goes to Rick um, White, because you mentioned this as well about the critical role of SMEs. And as you have seen from the report, we're using available data that's you know publicly available. Uh, Sonia has, has mentioned also reaching out to some organizations to fill data gaps but what essentially this means is that we might leave out a lot of small and medium enterprises who are really really critical in the food system space and what are some of your thoughts in terms of how we can include this group of very key actors in um, in the food system over to you uh, rick thanks jemima very important question thank you um that, that is a group that is one of the harder ones to get to, I guess, from a data perspective. So I, I do think, um, you know, uh, national um, countries uh, in, in, in supply and statistics for the agricultural sector needs to do a better job at tapping into, say, for example, farmers, farming, and the small businesses out there, um, at, at least from, from a Canadian perspective, Statistics Canada can uh, and does collect some of that data, but I think we need to find it and we need to collate it and we need to put it into a meaningful package globally um, to, to, to get a good read on what's going on in that very important segment because there's a lot of there's a lot of people in there. And I think it's in, and I know it's in the interests of that sector, it, of the SMEs, um, just like it is in other areas of the agri-food chains. Uh, we need, from a human resource perspective, in my view, the best and the brightest people in these roles producing food and nutrition for the for the world is too important of a job in all parts of the supply chain um, to not have the best and brightest people there and when we don't have gender equity to me that says we're missing out as a as an industry on the best and brightest people because we don't have gender uh, equity involved in there and we need to tap into that we need to show that this is the way forward to healthy businesses, healthy communities, healthy social uh, issues as well. They're all tied together. And, and at the end of the day, from a talent perspective, we need the best that we can be because this is too important of a job to not have the best and brightest. And uh, somehow we need to get there and collecting the data, analyzing the data and providing that bright light, that transparency, will drive accountability right down the SME and the farm level as well. Thank you very much, Rick. And Lawrence, I know you have some thoughts on this too, but I did also want to ask you the question of youth. We've been with you in the UN food systems process, you know, um, the, the youth coalition, how do we get, um, how do we, you know, have that diversity of youth and measure that across our food systems organizations as well. Yeah, thank you, Jemima. On, on the SME question, uh, your listeners will know maybe the Access to Nutrition Index, which is an accountability mechanism for big private sector companies, food and beverage companies, and it looks at whether they, what they say and what they do on healthy foods. And we've been working again with ATNI to extend this 
into the SME space. And so for SMEs, you can't really frame it as an accountability mechanism because they don't really have the resources, nor, nor, nor is it helpful, we think, to sort of frame it as an accountability mechanism. But we've set up a, a kind of a self-evaluation, um, a remote self-evaluation tool, which allows them to diagnose how, much, how well they're doing on nutritious food and help them do better on nutritious food. So it's more of a capacity development self-assessment tool. And I could see Global Food 5050 doing something like that, building a self-assessment tool for SMEs that is less about accountability and more about uh, capacity development to support transformative uh, gender gender work. Uh, on the on youth, I'm 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 a bit I'm thinking about this a lot because uh, for me one of the big learnings at the summit is um, uh, youth have a lot to gain from decisions that are being made now, but have virtually no say in the decisions that are being made on food systems. And um, so now it's becoming very uh, kind of trendy to, to let's say, let's talk about youth engagement. But I'm really interested now in whether organizations are walking the talk on youth engagement. So GAIN has adolescent programs. And three years ago, we said, we're never going to do an adolescent nutrition program without adolescents being part of the design process. So never about us without us. But, you know, uh, do we have a, a youth focal point on the GAIN board? No. Uh, do we have people under the age of 30 on our senior management team? No. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about uh, how could we do something like Global 5050 for youth, or how could we expand into the youth area? Obviously, you can take that to an extreme and have you know 50 indicators, 50 different dimensions. So you have to be careful. But I think it's something. I think it's something that we need to. Um, hold big organizations accountable for don't just say it do it back to you thank you that's that's something that's food for thought in terms of how we we we, we do that um i have a question for for you vicky that's actually coming from from the audience um so we're talking about um equity and gender in food systems organizations. And there's a couple of questions there in terms of how do we translate this all the way to the pharma level? And you spoke a bit, a little bit earlier um, about you know, your work on the, on the ground, just so that we deal with that particular, uh, particular question. A couple of thoughts from, from you, Vicky. Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great challenge. Um, and it's something we're working on. Um, there's a few things we've put into place to help us figure this out as we go. Um, one of the things we're doing is for every single investment we make, it is um, graded, frankly, as to whether it is unintentional gender intentional or gender transformative and there's a number of questions in that like uh, you know how much how many of the outcomes and goals are devoted to equity equality outcomes what kind of staffing and expertise is is embedded to help that happen is the uh, data being uh, disaggregated by sex and age for example can we track women and youth through this um, and so forth. And, and the power of this is that every investment as it goes to our leadership in its review, leadership can see, oh my goodness, but this is unintentional. This isn't designed to include it and it can be rejected and sent back. And so you could imagine this is sending, creating quite a, a flurry and an, and an increase. And what happens is when we're doing this at our level of, of Fighting on grants, it creates a ripple effect among our partners. And, and within the partners, they are looking for more expertise, more representation, better data, and so forth. And then as we make the investments, we provide the resources so that those capacities can be strengthened. So that's one way through the grant making. But frankly, um, what's new and different is how we're thinking about right now, there are a lot of barriers to local organizations accessing the Gates Foundation. Yeah, we're, we're not very good at working with small level, local level. We're, you know, we're just 
we're not very good at that. Um, and so we're, we're looking at our processes and seeing what could change to make us more accessible. Um, and frankly, it's probably going to be through some intermediaries, intermediaries who then directly support local organizations, but could then provide that back office stuff, you know, the reporting, the finances and, and so forth without expecting that from local organizations. And I think this is really exciting um, and uh, look forward to making a change there. Thanks. And that's how we actually get the resources to where they are most needed and where yeah. they probably will have the most uh, the most impact. Um, one of the things I take away from this conversation is Global Food 5050 as a floodlight, as a beacon, as a mirror, as a spotlight from Rorans. And actually, um, Rorans introduced me to, to, to Kent. So in a way, uh, Rorans, there might not have been global food 50-50 um, without you making those um, making those connections. So I'll hand back over to you, uh, Katara. Thank you very much, Shemaima, and to everyone on our panel for those insightful remarks. We are coming to the end of our program. So let me now call on Sarah Hawks, co-founder and co-director of Global Health 5050, to provide closing remarks. Sarah, over to you. Thank you very much, Katala. And um, let me start by saying a huge thanks, not just for um, your contributions to the panel uh, today in various parts of the world, but for this really wonderful partnership that has been catalyzed, as we've heard by, by Lawrence, but has been very much taken up by everybody involved on both the Global Health 5050 side and the IFPRI side. So I just have a, a, a few remarks, but as anybody who works with me will know, I like I do like to start with thinking backwards, sort of where, where did we all come from? How did we get to, to the position we're in today? And I have the privilege of spending a lot of my life thinking about how we talk about and understand notions of gender and gender equality within the global health system. And what has become very clear in the years that we've been looking at gender equality in the global health system is that the very terminology of gender is a very new terminology in global health. We've only been using the word gender since 1992. And that we borrowed that word, we co-opted that word, we inherited that word from the food and agricultural sector, from the pioneers of, um, of the, de the, the, the development specialists and the agricultural specialists working in food systems and agriculture, who were really concerned about issues of who owns the land, who inherits the land, who benefits from the land. And so in the global health system, we have spent many decades now, several decades now, thinking about what this idea of gender and gender equality means to the global health system. So I feel like we've come sort of back in a slight circle that we're now talking to each other again about issues of gender and gender equality and how to hold ourselves accountable for all of those commitments that we have made as systems over the ensuing decades. And I'd just like to offer a, a, a few points of reflection from having been involved with my colleagues in Global Health 5050 over the past um, five years, and obviously more recently on Global Food 5050. And I think you've heard these points made during this afternoon, or this morning, wherever you are. The first is that gender is about everyone. Gender is about everybody in society and that gender equality is everybody's responsibility. And importantly, and I think this is part of the message that we've seen very frequently gets lost, is that gender equality benefits everybody in society. This isn't just about half of society benefiting from notions of equality. We've seen that everybody benefits when the world is a more equal place. 
The second is that wherever we look, we have seen that systems are never gender neutral. Systems are very frequently gender blind or gender unaware, but they are never gender, gender neutral. And that's what we're trying to capture in these accountability mechanisms. The third is that transforming systems is important but systems exist within societies. And unless we also look at the deep structural gender inequalities that all of us operate within in every society in the world, including in the domestic sphere, then we are very unlikely to achieve truly transform transformational change within whatever system it is that we're, that we're working within and operating within. As has been noted today, change is possible. We've seen that even over the, the very short space of time that we've been running Global Health 5050, we've noticed some progress. Sometimes that progress is one step forward and a couple of steps back, but generally there is that the progress has been possible. And we're really strong believers that progress is possible through the power of collective action. And so I would like to just finish on the point of saying that I am truly delighted that the global health system and the global food system can come together to achieve what can really be sustainable transformational change, whether it's at national or global, all local levels through the power of acting together. So thank you. And I look forward to this being a very strong partnership in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that summary. Thank you to all of our program participants and to you, our live audience, for joining us for this rich discussion on the inaugural Global Food 5050 report. And thank you to Freeze Communications and Public Affairs team. I invite everyone to join a free next week on Thursday, October 14th at 9.30 a.m. for a special event on ideas for confronting climate change today. With that, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everyone.